<laughs> yep, we're back. <laughs> kind of like the cockroaches. You can't get rid of them. <laughs> ah, you're back to uh, Piper's Pit. It's a pleasure to have you back. And uh, holy cow, we had uh, JR on last week. Quite a plethora of uh, guests. Bobcat Goldthwait we had. Jesse Ventura. I have John Carpenter going to come on here pretty soon. And it's been a fun, it's, you know, I love doing this podcast. I'd like to do uh, more of them. You know, I'd even do one a day. I don't have a problem with it. But uh, I guess we've got a few other guys that uh, like to do it too here at Podcast One, which is the best podcast facility, period. Uh, my producers are the best producers, period. All right. So one of the cool things about uh, podcasting here is it's always free for you. Uh, we never charge you. Podcast One never charges you. All the people that you on there never charge you. And the way that we can do that is by you going, like you go to Piper's Pit uh, and, uh, you know, you log in Podcast One, go to Piper's Pit and go to the Amazon link and you click the Amazon link. It's Christmas is coming. Buy whatever you want to buy it from the Amazon link. There's no ties to it. You don't get charged any more at all. And you do what you want to do, get there, and then leave. And uh, what they do is they kick back to the show. I always try to give you 110%. Uh, go to RowdyRoddyPiper.com where the store is. Uh, and, you know, you can buy villain T-shirts, hot rod T-shirts. Uh, I got a new soda pop, all out of bubblegum. Only I can convert a movie into a soda pop. <laughs> and I got bubblegum coming in following that. I'm trying to make it healthy for the kids, you know. So, uh, got bubble gum. You can get off uh, RoddyRoddyPiper.com. You got uh, all kinds of Christmas stuff, hot rod t-shirts, villain t-shirts. Uh, because they say I'm the greatest villain in the history of professional wrestling. In the history. I'm the biggest asshole in the history of the WWE. Uh, whatever. Everything's got W's in it. Um, this week, uh, this is really interesting. Uh, I have a gentleman, I'm not sure if I've met this fella, but um, he has written a couple of books. Um, but one of the books that caught my attention was called, is called, pardon me, The Death of the WCW. Now, I, uh, obviously, I was in the WCW. We used to call them back then, the war. I was in the wars. And uh, this gentleman has kindly come on, and we're going to get into it as far as, you know, what did happen. Because uh, there's so many, you know, rumors and, and uh, just like uh, people's opinions instead of facts uh, that I would really like to hear what, the, what they're attributing it to. Because I have my own opinion on it. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, do we have the gentleman yet? We do. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, with all due respect... A uh, 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 gentleman that has written uh, three books. Uh, I think he also hosts WrestleCrap. Um, or, or that, that's his. But right now, that's big. I think maybe the 10th anniversary and wrote The Death of the WCW. Please welcome uh, R.D. Reynolds. Hey, bud. Hi, Roddy. How are you doing today? I'm a box of fluffy ducks, champ. How are you doing? <laughs> where, where are you fantastic. calling in from? Where are you calling in from? I'm calling from Indianapolis, Indiana. Thank you so much. Uh, it's mm -hmm. very kind of you. So, um, baby Jesus, where do we start, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, first I wanted to, I wanted to say, uh, you know, you were mentioning that you have the Amazon links. Yes, sir. On, on, on your site. Yes, and sir. And that's, that's very important because WrestleCrap has that too. But everybody should ignore the WrestleCrap one. They should go to your site. Uh, and if it's you. like the Amazon deal I have, you get more depending on what the price of the product is. Yes. And I was searching, and I saw there there is now a $120,000 television on Amazon. Everyone oh, should go oh, buy that yes. TV through Roddy Piper's site. I love that. Uh, yes. I mean, this man, won't you? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is that very, very kind. Very kind. Um, you, get, you got a tremendous, uh, I believe this was a number, became a number one seller, the death of WC. W. Um, yeah, it was it was it was know. something that was. Uh, I mean, the whole writing of books thing is kind of 
I mean, it all kind of came from out of left field. Fifteen years ago, I started a website called WrestleCrap.com. Yeah. The very worst of pro wrestling. And, the, and my goal was always to talk about the stupid things that wrestlers are made to do. Gotcha. It's never to say, oh, look, this guy had, look at how silly this, this guy was. I understand. I mean, it was something that I always would look at and go, man, I know, like, one of my best friends uh, in the business, and unfortunately he's, he's gone from us, was John Tenta. Earthquake. Oh, gee, he was great. I love oh, John. Yeah, he was awesome. But yes. You remember he was he was Earthquake in the WWF, yep. and then he went to WCW, and they told him, okay, now, John, you're going to be the shark. And the so shark. He had this, yeah, he was going to be the shark. <laughs> and <laughs> okay. He, he had this giant tiger tattooed on his arm because he went to LSU. Yes. And so they were the tigers, and he had this big tattoo of a tiger on, on his arm. <laughs> and they told him, well, you know, John, you can't go be a shark if you have a big tiger on your arm. <laughs> so he went in, and he had 20 hours of tattoo to try and make it look like a shark. And no. it came out just looking like a blob. <laughs> Uh -huh. But like, he was doing uh, everything he could to to support his family, to to put money right. on the table, yep. you know, to, to feed his family, right? So I if they tell that. you to do something, you do it. So he goes and he does all this work so that he can be the shark. And then two weeks later, Eric Bischoff comes to him and goes, "Yeah, this shark thing's just not working out. We're not going to have you be the shark anymore. <laughs> well, try elephant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Gee, yeah. Oh, gotcha. That's brutal, huh? Yeah, that's just brutal. That's what, that's what we always focus on. Gotcha. Uh, at Russell Crap. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then, like, and listen, bud, um, you're so kind to come on uh, my my show that uh, I, I have all the respect in the world for you, and I don't, you know, I don't take advantage of anybody. But I want you to be f free to be able to say whatever you want to say, especially mm -hmm. about about me. Uh, you know, there's, and I'm sure you can do two hours on me. However, <laughs> thank you know, God. I, Go. I, I probably can't because I have a confession to make. Okay, I actually have. I I used to have a dog, uh, and his name was was Raleigh, real close to Roddy, right? <laughs> yeah. And now I have a dog named Piper. So I I, I hate to, I hate to sound like a mark or anything, but I'm kind of a fan. I so love you too, Raleigh Piper. Be, uh, w this will be a love fest. There not you like go. The, uh, not like the uh, three hour war I had with uh, Vince Russo a couple weeks. Ago, oh jeez, so. what a waste! <laughs> uh, I love you. I got it. So let's get to it. What what? You know, let's just get started. The death of the WCW. Um, mm -hmm. Like so, uh, where do you pick it up? Like how the WCW started? Out or where do you pick it up in the book? Yeah, we we start at the very beginning uh, and try and it's talk a good place. about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's funny because we were, originally we were going to have this book. Uh, you know, ten years ago, it was going to be like a handbook. These are all the things not to do in a wrestling promotion, and we were like, that would be a horrible book. So we just made it chronological. Yes, but yeah, we we started at the beginning and we talked about how you know WCW came to be. Uh, you know, was originally uh, basically evolved from the National Wrestling Alliance. Yep. Uh, and then, of course, from Jim Crockett Promotions, which which obviously you were very familiar with. Boy, oh boy. Whoosh. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> Rolled and those then, highways. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can only imagine, you know, the, <laughs> the amount of miles oh. that you put in on those roads, oh, man. Oh, baby Jesus. <laughs> uh, you know, things that uh, not even Wrestle Crap will put on their website <laughs> happen then. <laughs> so you started, because, like, I didn't come to WCW. I think I was one of the last uh, to get there. But when, mm -hmm. when, uh, when did you come in? And, like, why did Turner buy it or decide to buy it? I'm just trying to get us to where all of a sudden it's starting to take off. Uh, yeah. well, let, you know, tell me about it. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, Jim Crockett Promotions and the NWA was on the Superstation. Yeah. And it was on there for years and years. Uh, you know, in the early days you were there, but yep. then you went to the WWF, and a lot of the guys went to the WWF. You know, I went to New York and went with Vince. Yep. And what happened is Jim Crockett, God bless him, and in, in the book he even admits this, he would just keep spending like there was no problem with money ever. 
I mean, like yeah, money yeah. grew on trees. Oof. So he would be flying, you know, the boys everywhere and, and flying on private jets and partying it up and everything. Yeah. And eventually he discovered, uh, much to his chagrin, he was out of money. Okay. But, That's a bad day. Yeah. But the, you know, w, you know, WCW Saturday night would do great ratings. Yeah. So the Turner company said, okay, we'll just, we'll just buy you out. And so okay. that's what happened. Okay. He wound up, uh, that, that's how uh, Turner wound up with WCW. Uh, gotcha. But they, but the first few years, you know, uh, of, you know, this new WCW, it, it didn't do well. I mean, you're talking about the, the doom and gloom era, you know, uh-huh. like when, uh, when Flair left. Yeah, you know, and he would have a fight with you know Jim Hurd, the yeah. you know the former Pizza Hut guy. Jim Hurd, else, holy right? cow! I haven't heard that name for a long time. <laughs> yeah, Jim Hurd. Yeah, the yeah, pizza Jim. guy. Okay, I can see Flair banging it out with Jim. Yep. Yeah. And so he left, and other people were leaving, and you started to see, you know, WCW was drawing these, you know, terrible, you know, house show numbers. Yeah. But they were still doing good ratings on television, so Turner wanted them around. And so it kind of muddled through for years, and people would, you know, WCW never made a lot of money. A lot of times they lost money. It depends on the year. Yeah. But eventually it just kept kind of muddling along until Eric Bischoff showed up. Okay. Now, so now Eric Bischoff came in as, did Heard bring Bischoff in? Was that how it was from not- Minnesota? Yeah, I'm not quite sure who who hired Bischoff. I know yeah. that he he had actually he came in as an announcer, and I mean he was like a third string announcer because I think at gotcha. that time and it may be a little bit off, but I think Jim Ross was still there or, or you know Chavani or whoever. Yeah, yeah. So he was not like a lead announcer, but at some point they you know they went through one of their 1,400 management changes in those days. <laughs> yes, sir. And Bischoff threw his name in the hat, and the people liked what you know the the Turner Brass liked what they saw in Bischoff. He was this young guy; he had he had fresh ideas, uh-huh. and he was, I think, what they really liked in him. Since you know the, you're talking about a corporate environment, they had been working over the years with people like. Um, Dusty Rhodes or Ole Anderson, <laughs> Ole or, Anderson, geez. you know, yeah. uh, uh, Bill Watts, hey, Lord, and Lord, Lord, <laughs> exactly. So they're like, oh my gosh, we got to deal with the, you know, these, these, yeah. these, you know, people that have all this history in the business and and they're kind of rough, you know, they can Oof. be rough to work with because yeah. they've seen how this business works. Yeah, for sure. That's... So they went with Bischoff and said, man, this guy is, is much more, you know, he's clean cut and he doesn't have all this back luggage. Yeah. Let's, let's it, try it out with him. Fresh pr- perspective on the business, too. Those guys that you just mentioned, Ole Anderson and Watts, they have, their, their mind was set in a certain structure. This is the way it has to be. And that, and that wasn't necessarily correct. Uh, sometimes there's many ways to get something accomplished. And if you got a guy with uh, fresh ideas that are coming in to get the same thing accomplished, uh, that's very, always very uh, appealing to these guys. Um, right. So, you know. so, yeah, he came in, and it was it was this fresh look, and it did not, you know, it did not pan out immediately. But the one thing that Bischoff was able to convince, you know, Turner Brass, specifically Ted Turner, because – Ted Turner loved wrestling. Oh, he yeah, he it. did. He saved, yeah. yep. You know that pro wrestling saved Turner. Did mm-hmm. you know this? That um, back, you know, we used to come in from, oh, geez, we'd have Richmond. Uh, and then, you know, <laughs> damn TVS was like 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, a lot of zombies walking in there. But I remember Turner building something. I don't know if it was the CNN set or something, but the, the fact that the wrestling and the ratings uh, from that T- uh, TBS show for, uh, that would put on, that kind of kept him in business while he was getting other things together. And he kind of, I don't know if he fell in love with it or it just was very loyal to it. You know, uh, he was a good guy. He, he, had, he, had, he had quoted, or we had a quote from him, I believe, where he said, you know, 
wrestling built the superstation, it's going to stay on the superstation. Yes, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so now Eric, all of a sudden, Eric Bischoff is in charge. That must have made a few heads go around. I was just with Linda Blair the other day. That must have, <laughs> I bet you some pea soup came out on that one, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah, because there were so many people that thought, you know, they had an inside track, but then Bischoff got it, and he convinced Ted Turner and the Turner Brass, let's break the bank and let's get some really big names into this company. Yeah. And they started, you know, they started with, with Hogan. They, yeah, started recruiting. Mm -hmm. And yep, so, and they, okay, so now, now was Nash and Hall already in uh, WCW when Hogan came? No, they were, they, were, they were not there yet. They had actually been in WCW, you know, we were talking earlier about the dark days, you know, with yeah, the yeah. drawing the bad houses. And Nash was there as... Uh, Vinny Vegas. Okay, and, gotcha. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and and Hall was there as the Diamond Stud with you know DDP sure. as his manager. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So now it's boom. It's uh, uh, Bischoff is now in charge, and here comes Hogan. Whew. Got everybody's yeah. attention. Yes, and so that got everyone's attention, and it was interesting because it was something where they were able to get Hogan because Vince. Felt, and I mean, you were there. You, you can probably tell the story better than me. Where Vince thought, okay, we got we got Hogan, we got Piper, we got Randy Savage, yeah. and we have all these guys. But you know, they're past their prime. No one wants to see them anymore. Yeah. And I always have thought that was such a big mistake on 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 <laughs> Vince's part. You know. Yeah. Uh, certainly showed him wrong when coming to the WCW. It started popping. It, and it was hot, you know, credit where credit's due. Uh, whoever was calling the shots in the beginning, and these people were, you know, these people were defecting. Well, they, here, here's one thing that I want to ask you, that I, mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I always had a problem with. It's like, you know, it was, it was the wars back in those days. It was a war. There's yeah. no, no war. I'm not in war. <laughs> I'm just working for one promoter, then another promoter. And that whole, that whole, um, uh, mentality of we're going to beat uh, the WWE or WWF, whatever it was, uh, and we're going to, you know, and we're going to do this. And like, hey, whoa, how about let's just concentrate on our business and whatever they do, because it was really a wonderful, wonderful thing to have two big leagues uh, in the world. It, it bred for better talent. It bred for better, the talent had some kind of uh, um, power, and you know which league you're going to go to. The fans, I think, loved comparing them and watching them. So the demise of the WCW is one of the worst things that could happen. The, the rise of it, I thought, was great. But uh, again, and they would come on, uh, like, and give the first... They came, oh, geez, man, help me out here. They came on at an odd time, like five minutes before, and they'd give spoilers to, uh, about the WWF, what they were going to do. I, I, yeah, never, I never understood yeah, that. that that was one of the big things that got – it was funny because people always went uh, – whenever Nitro was starting. Yeah. And everyone heard, oh, my gosh, it's going to go head-to-head -head with Raw. And people looked at WCW as this really second-rate promotion, even though Hogan was there. Yes. And people were, like, saying, oh, there is no way this is, this is going to play out. You know, WCW is just going to get trumped. But what people didn't realize is that WCW on Saturday nights – you know, six oh five Eastern on the Superstation. That's it. You know, they would, they would, they would do really, really good numbers. So when Bischoff got on live TV on Nitro, what he would do is he took everything that was always this is how the wrestling business is. And, you, and as you mentioned earlier, we had, you know, Ole Anderson who stuck. This is exactly how things have to be. Bischoff yeah. went in with a different approach, and he said. Vince has taped these four weeks in advance. I'm going to come out. I'm going to say, look, you know, this is what's going to happen on Raw. I can tell you this at the top of the first hour of Nitro. This is everything that's going to happen on Raw. Why would you watch that? Because I have just told you, but on Nitro, we're live. So you don't know what's going to happen. That's correct. So, yeah. 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 Uh, but the fact, like, why even do that? Why? I think. Why would you? Why? Why? Because he wanted, I really think that even in the early days, yeah, he wanted a fight, and 
like you, like you said, and, and actually, you you'd mentioned at the beginning of the show, you didn't know if we had ever met. We've met like one time, and it was at a Days of the Dead conference in Indianapolis, <laughs> Indiana. I love it. And you actually told me, you know, that you didn't understand why, why, you know, why do people think this was a war? This doesn't make any sense. And uh, I always, I always hung to that because I thought that too, because Bischoff was so, he was especially later. He was so much more concerned about what Vince was doing than yes. what taking his eyes off the off his own product. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, and so then you know, there's so much here. I'm trying to uh, keep some kind of sensible order to it, so my ADD doesn't kick in. Uh, um, the okay, so when Bischoff is rolling here and. Uh, now, okay, we're at war, I guess, if that's what they want to do. Um, and again, they, they did not, in not concentrating their own business, they being WCW and the hierarchy, um, they were doing this and trying to put Vince out of jail, uh, out of jail, uh, out of business. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, oops, uh, Freudian slip. Um, you must know something we know. <laughs> oh, boy, do I know. <laughs> I take the fifth. The eighth, the ninth, uh, but okay. So when uh, Hogan came, uh, Nash and Hall, and uh, here's one kind of cool thing that I thought they did, which uh, they had uh, the one, two, three kid. So they called him six. You know, one, yeah, two, three. You know, exactly. I don't know. Sometimes I like, you know, I get it off. And uh, so now, and uh, they're the uh, we're we're Nash and Hall and. X Pac were they already NWO thing before Hogan came in, or did they? When Hogan came in, did they all start doing that? I can't remember. They they, they had Hall and Nash there. Hall showed up first and said, and, and ironically, we were talking about how Bischoff wanted a fight. Yeah, Hall showed up and he he went to Bischoff. He wasn't challenging anyone else, and he said, you know, if you want to if you want a war, you've got a war. And the, the idea behind that was, oh, my gosh, look, there's this big WWF star. The next week, Kevin Nash shows up, another big WWF star. And then they lead it to, we're going to have our third guy show up. You have to pay for it on pay-per-view, yeah. novel concept, yeah. instead of giving it away for free on television, right? <laughs> yeah, you make them pay. And so that's what they did, and they built it up. And then Hogan showed up, and he, he made his, uh, he went uh, he went all evil yeah. Black and white NWO, and and that's when things really started taking off. Yep, and you know what? And the back, the back locker room behind the curtain started to get ugly. Uh, oh yeah! Holy cow! Yes, uh, it did. You know, so you know, uh, I'm, I'm loving you for being so straight up. I got uh, so it started getting ugly. I got to take a break. Let me take this break. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're with. Uh, uh, Mr. Reynolds, uh, R.D. Reynolds, and we're talking about the death of WCW, and you ain't heard nothing yet. We'll be right back. Well, when those bagpipes sounded <laughs> in uh, WCW, by the time uh, Hogan got there and Hall and Nash and Six Pack and the NWO, and, and they heard those bagpipes, uh, the audience loved them, but I don't think that they thought much of them. Um, I'm with uh, uh, the gentleman. He wrote the book, The Death of the WCW, and I believe it's in its 10th anniversary edition, and you've done where you put in more um, information and kind of revamped it, and it's a hardcover book that, uh, you know, people will want. If nothing else, obviously it's a great read, but if nothing else, that's the kind of thing you, you cherish and you put up there because the history of it, no, ma- no matter how ugly or whatever it is, it's, it's a huge piece of history in the business of professional wrestling, and you need to go get this book. Uh, I'm sure you can get it at Amazon. I'm sure you can get it all over the place. I'll check on the next break but uh let me get back to rd reynolds uh okay um so hogan comes in and uh there was if i remember correctly there was a lot of heat between uh nash um hall uh, and i'm not sure where six pack lied in there and and hogan as they felt as because they felt that they had been there and hogan coming in was mm, kind of uh, overtaking them, infringing on what they've already built. Would you agree or? Absolutely. It was, it was something where, you know, it's funny. We talked about, you know, 
Hall and Nash and Hogan, but the entire you know backstage was was so many egos, oh. and you had all these people fighting to get you know their name out there and their TV time. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, and everybody's saying, "Well, I have creative control. Well, I should have this. I should have that." Sure. And, T- tail and, wagging and, the dog. Tails wagging and, the dog. Exactly. You also had a situation where it was a volatile situation because not only did you have these people that were trying to get, you know, their name out there, they also had, and they don't have this today, an alternative. So if they got fed up and their contract was due, they did not have to stay in WCW. They could jump over to Vince or vice versa. So you, you had a lot of you had a lot of pieces in motion at that time that, that just does not exist anymore. Yeah, gotcha. So then, all right, let me just see here. At at what time? Okay, so the WCW is is rocking. Uh, excuse me, W WCW. Yeah, is rocking mm-hmm. and rolling. Um, yep. There's dissension between uh, the you know Hollywood Hogan, um, Nash and Hall, um, and I can understand where Nash and Hall were coming from if they were there. I always thought they were under contract. The WWF. I don't. I miss that part of how they got out of the contract and went to WCW. Unless... But their their contract their contracts had simply come due. Got it. And Bischoff made you know had come up with the idea for the NWO and okay. needed you know big you know big names yeah. and so he got you know two of the biggest names that that Vince had at the time brought them over and and made them the focal point and then Hogan showed up and Boom. you know then it became uh then what what was really interesting one of the things that led to the to the downfall of uh you know WCW you know they, it had its hot streak with the NWO yeah. but the problem was the NWO which started as a very tightly focused you had Hogan, Hall and Nash, three guys. Yeah. Then you get DiBiase, you get X-Pac you get all these other guys, and eventually, like you know, you're you're bringing in, you know, uh, Stevie Ray or yeah. whoever else. God bless Stevie Ray, you he's a great you. guy. But I mean, you've watered down what was a very tightly focused group. Very astute, absolutely, yeah. And uh, nobody knew where anybody was going uh, mm-hmm. backstage. Everybody, you know, nobody could agree on anything. It's too many, yeah. too many chiefs, not enough Indians, kind of thing. Um, yeah, and yeah, it was such a, it was such a battle because there were so many egos involved, and you had people fighting backstage. And at that time, I don't think Bischoff was really that concerned because they were winning his war, and yeah. so it doesn't matter if things are going good. Then who cares? Oh, you know, yeah, Paul yeah. and Nash are upset with Hogan. Who cares? Look at look at the ratings. Look what we did. This is great. Gotcha. It's when things started to fall apart. That you know, it's when those ratings started going down, and that happened when, you know, Vince got hot with, with uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah, that's when you saw things start to go so, bad. And yeah. At what real time? Bad. What time do you? What time do you think that Vince uh, started worrying about the WCW? When do you? If if you, at what time? Yeah, because he was he was losing. Uh, yeah, I mean it was it was during the I mean he, I'm sure he was concerned about it whenever he first heard, you know, Nitro is going to be coming on the air. Yeah. But I mean it was a it was a dead heat for, you know, basically a dead heat for a couple of years until until, you know, the NWO got hot. You yeah. Know, Sting is the crow got hot yeah. and was able to take over in the ratings. But I mean, ratings only tell part of the story anyway. True. And that's always something that kind of drives me insane is actually, like I said, I was on Vince Russo's podcast the other day and he was (laughs) like, well, I came in and I was going to, you know, drive ratings. And, you know, I was like, but ratings, that's only part of the story. That's what, you know, that isn't saying how many people did you draw when you were running these house shows? It's not saying how many people bought these pay-per-views. It's not saying how much merchandise are we selling. How many Roddy Piper t-shirts are we selling? You have to look at it as, you can't look at it in a bubble like that. You have to look at it as an entire company. Absolutely. Now, Mm -hmm. I'm going to just throw out some stuff that happened to me. Um, Let's just take Russo, for instance. And, Uh um, you know, I had a little uh, scrape with Russo. 
Um, actually, I was told <laughs> it's the highest. You know, guys got to check on this, but it got like 50 million hits and crashed my site. And, you know, and this is easily looked up, whatever the number is. But uh, when I came to, let me see, where was I? When I came to the WCW, first of all, I had told them if you tell it, there was only two people that knew, uh, Bischoff. And the guy um, oh, uh, was handling me at the time. I'm sorry, he escapes me, but I'll, I'll get him. And, yeah. uh, and so when I came, nobody knew that I was coming. And mm -hmm. uh, I think Randy Savage was wrestling Hogan. And all of a sudden, bagpipes, and there was Hogan, how you doing? And there was a Big Show, I called him Sprout. And, you know, and everybody's like, there's a static, everybody's happy, happy, joy, joy. But then it was like, okay, we'll put Piper on the treadmill over here while we headline over there. Okay, hang on. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay, so now listen to this. So I come in and I'm trying to, okay, what's going on? And the, Vince Russo had a, uh, I had never met him. And he had a guy, oh, shoot. Maybe Ed Ferrara. Ed Ferrara. That's it. Mm -hmm. So I'm in my locker room, and Ed Ferrara comes in and says, this is what we like. And wait a second. Where's the guy that runs the place? You know, uh, I'm an independent contractor, remember? Plus, I'm Roddy Piper. We're, what's going on? No, <laughs> we, we would like you to do this. I said, would you? This is exactly what I said to him. I said, well, let me ask you something. I said, uh, do you remember Owen Hart? And uh, it was tragic, wasn't it? He says, yeah. Oh, yeah. And listen, you know, we all, I'm not, I'll just skip on past that now. Um, but I said, uh, weren't you guys writing in the WWF at that time? Said, oh, yeah, yeah, we sure, you know, you, you guys are doing good, huh? Yeah, so um, I think it was Russo that that wrote that uh, that piece. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, so then maybe my interview should be, you're the ones that killed, Ru uh, you're the ones that killed Owen Hart? I, I swear to you. A bead, yeah. of, a bead of sweat come off his temple like a shot. And I'm all sure of something else came off something else oh, as well when oh, you said oh, that, yeah. And all of a sudden, Vince wants to speak. Hello, do I have your attention now? <laughs> uh, you know, it's all... Let's just start with that being... It, it, it seems like a small thing, but in, in, in the wrestling industry, in the wrestling business, uh, you need to take a stand... You need to be reasonable. You need to be fair. You need to know where you stand. Uh, but you can't let them walk on you because they'll just keep doing it. So that was my introduction. And mm -hmm. I'm, okay, well, you know, what, we're, what are we doing here? Um, and then uh, they wanted just, they, they didn't have anything in particular as far as, I, I've been on top by that time, sheesh, since I've been 19. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, there was no... Uh, there was no there was no working relationship they were they were trying to dictate i guess and uh that doesn't work for somebody that's like me wanted, that we, we, that's something i wanted to ask you about because it's something that honestly is as i watch wrestling now it kind of drives me crazy did vince russo or whoever whenever you were in wcw you know wwe wherever yeah did what was your reaction when someone would, you know, now everything is so tightly scripted. Yeah. Here is exactly what you know, Roddy Piper is going to say. Randy Orton is going to say this back to Roddy Piper. Yeah. What, I mean, the first time anyone ever gave Roddy Piper a script <laughs> at a wrestling show, <laughs> what was your reaction? Um, I was stunned. I, I had I had no idea, and... The, and, you know, they sent this guy, uh, one of the underlings, over. Mm -hmm. I, I said, what's this? <laughs> you know, like, am I ordering, is it a menu? Uh, what do I, <laughs> uh, I said, this is what we'd like you to say. Like me to say. I says, I gave it back to him. You, t you take that back to whoever gave it to you, and I'm going to go out there and say what's right. But uh, I don't play that. I've never seen that before. How are you going to tell Roddy Pfeiffer how to be Roddy Pfeiffer? No, and that's, I mean, that to me is something that, I mean, as I watch now, because it's always the same writers that are writing the dialogue for all for everyone. Yes. You know, if, if, if Roddy Piper was around today 
And obviously, you wouldn't put up with this. But let's say you were you were you were new to the business. 2014. Roddy Piper comes up. He wants to be a wrestler. Yeah. They give you a script. What Roddy Piper? Roddy Piper is going to sound exactly like everybody else. Yes. On, on because you're taking away the ability to say this is who I am. Yes, absolutely. And also, here's a big one: uh, is when you go to do an interview, or if I was going out for a match, I hated pyrotechnics, I hated music, because I can't feel what's going on in the arena. I never knew what I was going to do until I got out there. It's the same with uh, an interview. You know, hey, I might go, geez, uh, this is some, here's a couple of points. But as far as A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because every arena is different. Every post is different. Every subject is different. So... It's not an ego thing that you're, you're – it's insulting, be honest with you. You know, I took insult to it because I've been, you know, been doing it so long by that time and was one of the better ones at it, um, including a lot of, uh, you know, in a group with Dusty Rhodes, Flair, a bunch of other guys that are pretty damn good. And mm -hmm. and the, so – but it, what it does is this. It showed the ignorance as in lack of knowledge of the guys running things when they're giving me a script. Uh, that exactly. tells me, yeah, that tells me they don't understand what's going on and how a guy works. And uh, you, so even with the, if you, geez, man, it's just it's so wrong in so many ways. Uh, it's just uh, something that I can't uh, I can't abide by. I still yeah, still I mean, to this day. Like, it, I, 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 sorry to go off on a tangent on that, but that, no. that was something I always wanted to ask you. Yeah. Because I yeah. always just thought that was so absurd. But, I mean, you would see a lot of absurdities in WCW that were, you know, I mean, yeah. we would we we got so many stories of just, not just things at the at the shows, but just horrible mismanagement. Like, they would FedEx Chris, Jer FedEx Chris Jericho empty envelopes <laughs> with nothing in it. <laughs> they would they would buy you know one of my favorite stories in the book is um, I think it was Perry Saturn was talking about you know sometimes they would send me three tickets yeah. sometimes they would send me zero tickets I mean you're <laughs> if, if, if you if you're sending him three tickets you've obviously bought bought those three tickets yes so you know I mean you're you're, you're wasting all this money you're sending <laughs> blank envelopes they, they would run. You know, full page ads in USA Today cost like fifty thousand dollars, and they would have the wrong day listed on it. You know, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was it was my 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 goal always in writing ever since I started started the site was I want it to be funny. I don't really care if you know five people buy it or five million people buy it. I want it to be something that's funny. And whenever we started the Death of WCW book, I'm like. This is going to be like shooting fish in the barrel because you have so much mismanagement and it's going to make for easy comedy. So thank you yes. very much, uh, everyone at WCW. Yeah, I I don't know if you're aware of this, but I can remember there was a time when uh, Eric asked, you know, all the talent come in a room. And so we all. Oh, yeah. Do, were were you there? Or do you know this? You know the story? Uh, know we, we actually reported it. Uh, we, were, we have this in the book, but I'd love to hear your version of it. Okay. So, you know. I don't know. Where, where are you going? We got to go in there. Why are we going in there? Uh, you know, it's like, especially when you're working, I'm thinking, I'm doing, all right, all right, all right. So we all get into a room and finally Eric Bischoff comes in and uh, Hogan and myself are to Eric's right. And Flair is sitting down kind of right in, si uh, right in front of Eric. Uh, I think Eric might have had a little podium or something. And uh, so I'd be sad if he didn't. Actually, <laughs> no kidding. It was a, I should lie and just say it just in case. You know, just a, it's a better story. You know, embellish, <laughs> get a little bit. <laughs> and so Eric comes in, uh, very, very sincere. Uh, the first thing he said was, uh, besides uh, Hogan and Piper, uh, no, none of the, none others of you have drawn any money. Really, say okay. You got Ric Flair sitting right in front of you. Mm -hmm. Um, so he made that point and, uh, which, okay, thank you. But he said, now, uh, I'm here to tell you, um, that, uh, we're continuing, we're doing great. And that, uh, within two weeks, the WWF will be out of business. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just uh, hang on. I'm sorry. No, no. I thought you said that uh, something's wrong with my ears. Just run that by me again. It's going to be out of business. That blatant, that 
that. Mm -hmm. Like, okay. And questions come up like this, like, number one, why are we calling? What has that got to do with us? Why, why are we calling this meeting? Why, what, are we, what are we doing here? And uh, the meeting was just to tell us that uh, Vince is going out of business. And that, you know, there'll be a few changes, but, like, we're the powerhouse. And, uh, all right, get out there and do your job. Uh, go get the Gipper. And, and again, <laughs> focusing not on themselves, not on the own company, more keeping um, their eyes on what the competition yeah. is doing. And at the end of the, you know, if you're running that company, what do you care? If your company is making money, if your company is being successful, in the, you know, it's better for everybody if you have more interest in an industry. You know, I yes. mean, it would be the worst thing ever if, like, you know, Pepsi went out of business. Holy cow, you know, yes. For Coke. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So then, all right, so now, there, you know, I'm sure that there's got to be some, I was not popular at all <laughs> at the WCW, and there's things I've never, uh, I've never said. Backstage, you should say. Backstage, because, <laughs> because you did very well with you know, in, especially in the early goings. The, the, the you know, was, I always thought it was funny, but a lot of times the big shows that WCW would put on were shows that were like, why didn't we get these? You know, six years ago with Vince, why did we yeah. not get a big Roddy? P why didn't we get Roddy Piper versus Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania? Yeah. We, it, but we got Roddy Piper versus uh, Hulk Hogan at Starcade, WCW's biggest show. Yes. Why did we never get? You know, why did we not get uh, Hulk Hogan versus Ric Flair at WrestleMania? We got it at Starcade, WCW's biggest show, and it was those things that Vince said, "No, nope, that's not." That's not what we want to lead with, and those were the shows in some way, in a lot of ways, that did huge numbers for for WCW. I so. when I, I when I came in, uh, the first pay no excuse me, uh, I did the first pay per view and the second pay per view with Hogan, and by that time I had paid for my entire contract, three year contract. Oh yeah. Okay, so it's like I'm doing my job. What are you guys doing? Um, stay, but behind the scenes. It was really difficult because uh, they, I don't know what they thought I was going to do for them. I don't know what they wanted from me as far. I think they, you know, wanted to say, okay, your time is over. Lay down. Uh, no, 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 I'm not laying down for anybody. Right. And uh, yeah. um, behind in the dressing room, backstage dressing room, there was, everybody was pretty angry at me. Um not I don't really know <laughs> I don't really well, know I, why I think, I think that um, I think it was I think it was Conan we have quoted in the book that he talked about and, and a lot of people had told us just how miserable everyone backstage was yes it didn't matter you were making all this you know people were making all this money but even with uh, that they were they were just so unhappy miserable. because it was a miserable working environment. And at that time, this is the first time I've ever said this. At that time, I never told anybody. I had some kind of a disease that um, it was in the in my intestines, and my belly would go up and down, up and down. I threw up every day. This disease lasted ten years. Okay, and so, but I mean, that's not a, an excuse for anything. I'm I'm just kind of saying what I was going through personally and then professionally. What, what was happening. But one of the things that they decided to have a uh, cage match, and I'm not sure if this is in your, is in your book. I, I haven't uh, had a chance to read the entire book yet. I, I will. Mm -hmm. uh, but I ended up, uh, the, uh, the match of the icons. <laughs> Holy cow. After I won that match on the icon, the next week Randy uh, Savage had icon on his knuckles and Hogan had icon on the <laughs> Slip that one right by you, did I, guys? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, but um, so the cage match at MGM Grant. Uh, and I, I heard later, I don't know Jim Cornette. I, I, I never, I don't know really know the guy. I'm not sure I've ever really met him. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, but he had done an interview after this cage match. You know, it's the worst cage match ever seen, and da 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 da. -da. Um, uh, you know, of which I never said anything back. But then I want you to go back now, uh, when you're finished on YouTube, and I want you to pull up that cage match. Is this what happened? We come out there, and I don't know who put that cage up there, but you take a look at it, 
and the cage is about mm, seven to ten feet from the ring apron and the cage was built with um uh just stick with me uh like metal cords um with aluminum for the squares they were aluminum cylinders and they weren't attached to the uh the jeez come on rob what would you what do you call it um uh, steel line that they have help me out here tell you call it you know, the, the, like to the ring posts? Or, uh, no, or no, the the actual cage. It's like uh, it was in in squares. Okay, for okay, Latin. okay, yeah, no, exactly what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, cable. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. thank God I got seven people around here helping the dumb wrestler <laughs> out. Okay, but now here's the fact, and I've never said anything. So uh, as cables, and uh, it was just aluminum round um, pipes that they put in, not attached to the cables. So when you like went to step up, the thing would spin. And you'd oh, look, yeah. and you'd come down. Now, wait, you know, the ring is so far away, it, you get to the top, you can't make it. You're going to die down there. There's no way to go. For, if I wanted to hit, if we went to the top and I hit Hogan and he fell into the ring or I fell into the ring, it, you couldn't have done it. You would have yeah, killed yourself. You know, you know that, that that being you know when you say w, you know I was in a cage match I immediately thought oh my god it's in WCW what did they do wrong oh, because I, it was so, always like I, it was always especially in the later years it was always morons. like okay, what is the worst case scenario because that's what I'm about to see on my television oh and then Hogan and I get to the top you know we're both pros whatever anybody wants to say about us we're both pros we get to the top and this cage is like swaying. And, you know, um, we're hitting each other, and the top uh, steel bar right between our legs, it breaks when we're up there. Mm. Okay. Hey. Hey, buddy. <laughs> Let's try the other corner. It breaks. <laughs> okay. Now I got to And it was high. It must have. I don't know. I don't know in feet. 25, 30 feet, 7 feet away from the apron. Take a look at it. It was the worst. And so... Ah, uh, boy, the pummeling I took from, uh, and I've had a lot of cage matches. Uh, uh, it was, um, it, it was very difficult to take that, uh, the uh, backlash, but I felt like in defending myself in any kind of way um, that, uh, I don't know, I, I just did feel, I just felt that I'm going to let it stand. I didn't need to prove anything. I, uh, uh, I was so hot. <laughs> I was so angry. Um, I mean, but you you would see a lot of that. I mean, all the time. I mean, it, you, you would have things like that. You would have you know editing on television shows where I mean, there was one that they had done, and this was years before Nitro, where they had pre tapes, and you know they would tape things in advance. So you would have on those pre tapes, you know, if you tape three weeks in advance, someone wins a title or what have you. Yeah, and they would air, you know that, hey, uh, you know, so-and-so is going to be defending this title before the guy ever won it. And you'll be like, wait, what happened? What did I miss? And, and they would do stuff in editing like that all the time. I know. So, so that they, uh, so that if you're asking them, I mean, if, if you have a uh, company that does this, if you have a company that sends empty uh, FedEx envelopes to people, you're asking them now to put up a cage? <laughs> let's, let's not let's not risk uh let's not oh, risk it you know and they and they didn't care because they weren't up there they right. didn't have to climb that and whoever did it could not have i don't couldn't have been in the wrestling industry business never been in a cage match either that or they were hoping that we both died and they could replace us with somebody else i gotta take a break and we'll be right back with rd reynolds to get more juicy yeah little randy savage yeah, well, as I told you, the bagpipes is an instrument of war. And what are we talking about? The WCW wars with the WWF. Uh, with a gentleman, R.D. Reynolds, who is the author and uh, of Death of the WCW. And it was, what was, it was co-written by Brian Elvarez. Um, yep. So, uh, all right now, all right. Tell me in the book. Why did 
what what made it fail? What was the beginning of the demise? The beginning of the demise was people behind the scenes that were producing shows, making shows that no wrestling fan wanted to see. And wrestling fans are very vocal about what they want to see. So if you keep presenting something that no one wants to see, they are eventually going to go away. Yes. And that's and they presented shows that weren't just things that people didn't want to see that actively drove people away. One of the famous things is we we were looking at uh, they had Hogan I believe it was uh, it was a one year period and they had a Hogan versus Ric Flair match. This was like in '99. And it did this big buy rate because even then Hogan, you know, Hulk Hogan versus Ric Flair was a big deal. Less than a year later, they had lost ninety percent of what of the you know the revenue they had gotten for that exact same match. So they ninety percent, ninety percent. If Ronald McDonald appeared on my television and said I'm going <laughs> to spit in every fifth burger. I don't think that the McDonald's will lose 90% of their paying audience. Oh. But that's what WCW did. And okay, and, and that you're attributing that to uh, people that didn't know what they were doing in the background, writing, uh, are you? Emotion? That, that and just not listening to what people wanted. I mean, it was, yeah. wrestling fans are very vocal. They well, will tell you if what you were okay. showing, I mean, you know this. I do, but let me let me throw something at you because one of the sure. things that that also uh, was like, hey, the, the those old guys should pack it up. When referring, I'm sure to Hogan, myself, uh, maybe Flair should uh, you know pack it up and give younger guys the spots. But it was like, well, just hang on a second. First of all, um, you know, we we've held these slots for a long time because we've drawn a lot of money and. Uh, those slots are important, but I have no problem with some young guy that wants to come up and and get over. You know, I don't. I have no problem with that. But there weren't any. There weren't any that I knew of anyway that were trying to get a portion. I'll give you one, and I'm just. I'll just lay it on you. Is a guy named Buff Bagwell, and so they had me coming in. They wanted me to box Buff Bagwell. Buff Bagwell. Yeah. Okay. And there was a. I think the referee. I forget his name, but the gentleman like had had a referee, uh, something like 102 uh, heavyweight champion boxing matches or whatever, and they want this uh, they want this guy uh, to, to get over. And uh, Buff Bagwell, all right, here we go. And I'm in the ring with him, you know, and I'm kind of figuring, what are you doing? And boom, I throw a couple of punches, and boom. He literally turns his back to me and covers up his face. And I just like pause and I look over at the referee like, are you fucking ribbing me? Pardon me. Whoops. <laughs> you know, like, what do you want me to Beep. say? Yeah, thank you, beeps. Uh, like, I, you ribbing me? Turn around. Well, is this the guy that's going to take my job? I didn't, I know that they had um, Goldberg, which I, I love Goldberg. And like, yeah. they were going like 60, the 60th win or 59, whatever it was, and building mm -hmm. them. But, uh, but who were those guys that were going to take our place? I think that Goldberg is is probably the most interesting of of any of the discussion points we can have about this period because he was WCW's last. I really think he was their last chance. The things had gone so south with the NWO, but then Bill Goldberg comes along, huge star, huge star. Yeah, and he does this winning streak, and it really gets over. You get to Atlanta. And for reasons we get into in the book, we won't we won't spend our time talking about it today. Gotcha. But instead of being on pay per view, they put it on free television. But it draws a humongous house. It was near million dollar house. Whoa! And then they decide not long after that we're going to beat Bill Goldberg. Now I don't know, well, Roddy, you know this as well as anybody. When Hulk Hogan was in the WWF, yeah, and and he was he would just he ran through people during that that the late eighties. Yes, and he never got beat. I mean, he he would lose by count out or he'd lose by yeah. DQ, what have you. But he would never get beat, and he did that for years and years and years. Yes, and but they decided with Bill Goldberg. Well, we can't do that. You know, we, gotcha. we have to go ahead and beat him. And as soon as they beat him, I mean, 
it was funny. I think uh, Kevin Sullivan called it the, you know, the Titanic was sinking. Bobby Heenan <laughs> called it the Hindenburg. You know, I mean, everybody knew this is a terrible idea because that streak was everything. And once you took the streak away, you took a lot away of, of Goldberg's mystique. Yes. And that really cost the company untold yes. amounts of money. Okay, so then what? at what point do these guys realize... Uh, I, I, I'm looking for, I'm trying to remember, what guys were going to come up, if you could give them a push, that were going to draw more money than the, uh, what do you want to call us, the uh, Iconics, the Dinosaurs. I, I remember they're saying, you know, ah, yeah, you paved the road, but uh, no, you, you, you made the road, Piper, but you left a lot of potholes. Oh, really? <laughs> Honest, we'll fucking fill in the fucking holes. Are you shitting me? You know, like, yeah, I paid the road. I chopped down the trees. I killed the snakes. And now you're coming along and you're going to be the ones that are going to tell me that I should get out because I'm older. And at this time, I got a hip. Uh, this is a 94, a total mm -hmm. hip replacement. And I'm still drawing more money. And I'm still, uh, I'm still outperforming you. The, you being, being the, the higher. So who are they looking, who are, the, who are the ones that were bitching saying, hey, these guys are holding back these young guys? Well, I think they, there, there were a lot of people, the younger guys were, were just feeling this frustration that they could not, you know, move up any, any further. You had people like Eddie Guerrero. Uh, you know, who okay. went on to be a big star for Ben. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but let, me, let me, but let me tell you this, though. If uh, when uh, any territory you want to say that I've been into, I've been, I don't know how many territories I've worked, to be honest with you. Probably 12 before I got my break. But any territory that I went to, we'll start with uh, uh, Los Angeles. There was Colas, there was Blasi, there was Gorman, Goliath, Guerreros. You know, I had to get in there and work my way up. Boom, Portland, Oregon, brand new, right? Boom. I had to get in there, Buddy Rose, and work my way up. Charlotte, Flair, Briscoe, I mean, the talent, and work my way up. Boom, over to Atlanta. Do with uh, Gordon Soli. Boom, Morocco, blah, blah. work my way up. New York, I'm here. So, like, it's like, if you can't figure out how to get to the top, then you don't ask, you do. <laughs> right. And, and I think that there was a lot of cases where, you know, you would have somebody, again, like like Goldberg, who was able to get to the top. Yes. But then once he got there, everything conspired against him to prevent him from staying there and prevent him from being able to really propel, you know, WCW to that next step. I also think it's something that you can have. You know, you mentioned, you know, in, in, uh, in, in L.A., you had, you know, John Tolis, you had Blassie. Yep. You had that core, and that core could work with the younger talent to really boost everything up. Yes. It's not something where it has to be one or the other. It has it's, to be something where all the pieces work together. If they had said, if they had some guy and they said, hey, Rod, we need to take you. Would you give them a rub here? And you betcha. Because I was mm -hmm. 15. I know exactly what they're going through. You betcha I'll give them a rub. You Come on, champ. Let's go out there and figure it out. But I think that uh, if you've never gone through the territory days where, you know, you, you go around, geez, for 12 territories, just getting mm -hmm. the dog, dog beat out of you, and all of a sudden, you know, boom. Okay, so it could, it could have been a lot of luck that you got over in one territory. You go to the next territory, boom. Hmm, yeah, maybe double luck. Third territory, boom. Okay, hang on. That's not luck. Fourth territory, boom. That's not luck. And these guys... They never ever had, you know, they never had to get go into a ter. Uh, let's take New York before uh, Junior had it, uh, when his dad yep. had it. Okay, mm -hmm. come to New York, Bruno San Martino, Andre the Giant, Tony Atlas, da -da, you know, Morocco, Fuji, da -da -da. <laughs> come in, boom, you're on top. Those are those are real seriously talented people. And so when I get back, I know the ultimate warrior, God bless your soul, saying, ah, these guys, they go out there, they're old. They, hang on, hang on. I've been doing this since I was 15 years old. I am wrestling. I, it's, it's, my, it's my business. I, it's in me. I, I can do this as long as I want until the fans just say, hey, we don't want any more of Piper. And that reflects in the ratings that reflects in what you do but still to this day if i go on they uh, they get a higher rating if i do a piper's bet to this day so i go back to who were these guys that uh, that they wanted to give me a name give me a name think, of somebody well i mean i always keep going back to goldberg 
You know, and I mean, that, okay. that, I agree on was, him. And, it, and it's something, you know, it's, it's, it really is something where I think that all this talent can exist together. As far as, as far as a name, yeah. I mean, if you look at somebody like, um, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll throw out, uh, like Booker T. Okay. And I don't know that he would ever be, I, I mean, it's so tough to get a, Hulk Hogan, a Roddy Piper, a Randy Savage, those mm-hmm. those kind. I mean, it's so hard to get something in that level, but you have to start with something and give them a chance to Absolutely. kind of break through. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But uh, at no time did they ever come. They be in the echelon, like Vince Russo. I, I got uh, some Twitter questions, and I but I want to kind of keep it on track here. Is mm-hmm. what, why doesn't Vince Russo accept the truth about how much money the company lost and he <laughs> lost it? You know, this is uh, Ben Carras, yeah, C A R A S. You know, that's the thing. That actually reminds me. It, it, yeah, because I. It, WCW lost $62 million in one year. Baby Jesus. And exactly. <laughs> but, I mean, it was, it was something where you, you mentioned, okay, you know, we've got Roddy Piper, we have Hulk Hogan, we have Randy Savage, we have these big stars. And something that WCW was able to do in its later years is they were able to, no matter how big a star you were, if you're Hulk Hogan, if you're Roddy Piper, if they're Randy Savage, they produced these terrible television shows that really crippled your ability to be that big draw that you that you want. I see what you're saying. I get yeah. you there. Yeah, yeah. That is. I mean, they okay. were on those. I mean, shows that were were so incredibly awful that you would, you would sit there. I mean, I watched it because, I mean, yeah. at the time, I'm sure that, you know, my idea of, okay, I'm going to make this WrestleCrap website. I'm going to, I need material. I need material, I mean, baby. WCW in, in 2000 was like, oh, perfect. You know, I yeah. could watch Thunder, Thunder every week. And I was like, okay, there's, there's six months worth of material. There you go. <laughs> you know, and that's what, but, but if you're on a show, if you're on a show, and no matter how big a name you are, you know, Roddy Piper, Hulk Hogan, what have you, you're this big name, but you're on a show where you're having a Viagra on a pole match. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to want to, no one's going to want to stick around and see no. what Roddy Piper is doing because they're going to try and make Roddy Piper look stupid. They're going to try and no. make Hulk Hogan look stupid. And no matter how much you fight and you say, no, I'm not going to be able to, you know, I'm not going to do whatever idiotic thing you're going to do, they're still going to try and, and twist it some way yep. to where you're going to be doing something dumb. And no uh, one wants to see, no one wants to see these, the icons look stupid. No, they do not. Those people ran away from the product. That's, you know what? They do not want to see us look stupid. They don't nope. want to see us uh, making, you know, if you get there and you get too many people talking to you and you're walking out and you're kind of making a fool of yourself. I see Scott Hall coming down and he's got a drink uh, with a straw on it. You know, he's having a little sure. cocktail. I'm going like, and you know, hey, Scott's doing great now here, and I love him. But mm-hmm. like, time out. <laughs> a little cocktail on the way to the ring? Are you? Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah, okay. Again, Scott Hall. In, in the, the character's name at the time was Last Call Scott Hall. <laughs> oh, that's now, right. Who's going to take that seriously? <laughs> no shit. Excuse me in my language. There. No, really. Who's going to take that seriously? You know, I mean, I, the, go. The, the, the fact that WCW was able to take. Roddy Piper, Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, Bill Goldberg, were able, Ric Flair, all these people that were the biggest stars in wrestling history, and they were able to make them people that fans wouldn't stick around and watch or wouldn't pay to see. That is the talent of WCW. That is go. the ultimate yeah. condemnation of the company that they were able to do that. And then, you know, honestly, once it went into the free fall, they lost $62 million. Yeah. Then everybody you know, started at, fighting. At that point, the writing was on the wall. Yeah. And then the, the big catch at the end was we started at the beginning, we were talking about Ted Turner yeah. and how he, you know, had the ability, you know, he, uh, you know, wrestling built the Superstation. It will always be on the Superstation. When they yeah. had the, the AOL Time Warner buyout, yeah. Ted Turner was taken out of a position to protect wrestling. He didn't have the veto power whenever people, because people would come to him before, you know, before Nitro started or whatever, and they said, 
you know, wrestling is losing money. We need to get rid of it. And he'd go, no, no, no. It's going to stick yeah. around. And as long as I'm around, it's going to stick around. He's a good man. But, but once he was out of that position of being able to veto it, then they came along and said, you know, wrestling is, is no good. Turner couldn't do anything about it himself. And gotcha, that, gotcha. Is, that was the end of, of that's WCW. A, that's, a, that's, a, that's a sword in the heart. So as we're winding this up, you got to tell me, okay, in your book, what's the worst thing I've done? What do you got me for? <laughs> What's the worst thing? Bring, bring it on, baby. Is it a column? You know, is it, it's Wikipedia? Tell me. What did I do, baby? <laughs> <laughs> okay, worst cage match. I've addressed that. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, the, the one, the one go, thing. Go, bud. Um, I dare you. The, the worst thing you did? Yes. The, the one thing that is always really, really memorable to me yes. was, and we actually, <laughs> on my podcast, we actually did clips of it, is... There was a period uh, where you and Gorilla Monsoon yeah. and my, my personal hero, Bobby Heenan, yeah, yeah. were on primetime wrestling together. Yeah. And I remember this. Okay. You could tell, and again, this was, this was that era where you could tell this thing was completely ad libbed. Oh, oh yeah. It awesome. <laughs> you actually, at one point, you were, it was Halloween. And you had dressed up as Heenan, and 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 Gorilla had dressed up as uh, Brother Love. He was Brother Hate, and then uh, Bobby was uh, he was the genius. But at some point, you just went on a rant about you know there's going to be you, know, you you started giving safety tips to the kids, which was great, but it was this mad. Insane Roddy Piper safety tips. There's going to be idiots driving cars. You know, don't go into anybody's house. It doesn't have a light on. Don't be stupid. And that was always that was always uh, just so awesome. Is right there in the uh, dumbass <laughs> categories. Like when I beat up Santa Claus, Bobby Heenan, and all the little kids said, "Mummy, Roddy Piper just beat up Santa Claus." And all the mummies are calling USA Network going, "Kick him off! Kick him off!" Vince comes down. What did you do? I just, I beat up Heenan. He's Santa Claus. Yeah, it was Bobby Heenan because he took, he took the beard off. That's right. Said, There's no Santa Claus. I, I almost, we almost lost the whole shebang right there. <laughs> you know, uh, and there's, you know, when you're out there, if you're giving everything you got and you're, sometimes you get on a roll. I know, uh, I don't know, a couple months back. Uh, I uh, right now I just had a total reconstruction of my left rotator cuff, and mm -hmm. uh, and it's and it's going to work again, and it's wonderful. Um, but uh, you know, somebody asked me for a fifteen minute interview, and I did three hours. <laughs> you know, and next thing I know, it's up on demand. Something I don't even know. It's like I got hot, and I was out there, and I was hurting. So you know, sometimes when you do what we do, it's hard to every second be uh, at your best. I guess. And, mm -hmm. um, but you know, but one of the things is that's, I don't have a problem with them, uh, with anybody knocking me, uh, cause I'm a born heel. <laughs> it doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, go ahead and boom. Do you have a ticket? Oh, you do? Boo. Anything you want to say, bring it on. You know, I, one time in Madison Square Garden, I got to paraphrase it, but I'm in the garden and uh, everybody's going, Piper's gay, Piper's gay, Piper's gay. And, uh, this, you know, whatever, 24,000 views. And like, do, do you have a ticket? You do go right ahead. Piper's gay, yeah, yeah, you, know, like, you know, for you know, for the fifty grand I'm getting it, that'll be just fine. <laughs> okay, that's a good gig if you can get yeah, it. It's good work if you can get it. You've been wonderful. You've been wonderful. Well, thank you, and I thank, thank you, you for um, uh, coming on and uh, you know being a straight up guy. And uh, I do a lot of things wrong, you know, because um, I and that's how I learn. Uh, and I'm not stopping. I got one more match I want to have with my son, not against him as a tag. Uh, so I was going to say that they, that may not be uh, the best if you're saying I got to have one more match and it's with my son. <laughs> I know, yeah, little bastard. No, <laughs> <laughs> I love him so much. Um, so uh, you guys will get to pick that apart. But uh, you know, around your, you're not really part of this, but around. Uh, I, I try to get and be responsible for what you say. And then I won't come down on you so hard. Be, uh, but when it's my fault, I put up my hand. It's my fault. This is, uh, uh, you know, this interview right here. 
there, we, there's a couple of ways we both could have taken this. You know, we could have gone for the throats and do that. But you're, you know, I've never had the pleasure of ideas one time and, you know, straight up guy. And there's no reason to be, to, to take cheap shots. You know, that's, that's a whole other, that's the WCW in its dying days. Um, you know, R.D. Reynolds, the death of the WCW. It's the 10th uh, anniversary. You need to go. You need to get it. Uh, take a read of it, and you need to enjoy it. It was a real pleasure to have you on, and I hope uh, when other stuff that you got comes up, uh, you think of me, and uh, let's have you on again, and uh, let's get dirty and gritty and make a show that they'll love. Uh, you got it, Roddy. Thanks thank so much. You. Pleasure is mine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, R.D. Reynolds. God bless him, man. All right. Well, you know, we're out of here again, and uh, go to rowdyroddypiper.com. Get your, you know, it's coming up, man. Get your villain T-shirts, your hot rod T-shirts, uh, all kinds of good thing on Podcast One. Come on, where it says Piper's Pit. Push the link, takes you to Amazon. Do your shopping through Amazon, keeps this podcast free. Um, we got to do this kind of stuff. I'm going to have a special Christmas thing where you can get the first uh, Rowdy Rowdy Piper all out of bubblegum soda pop, which is in like a hundred stores now in America. Uh, Bevmo and uh, Rocket Fizz. And the bubblegum's coming out after that. You know why? Because I'm all out of bubblegum. So damn. Till I see you next time, I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. <laughs>